everyone. My name is Sarah Mueller, the CEO for Calgary Public Library. On behalf of the library, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this evening's event, the true story of the American woman at the heart of the German resistance to Hitler, presented in partnership with the Calgary Jewish Federation, the Edmonton Jewish Federation, and Edmonton Public Library. This program is part of a series generously supported by the Isidore and Florence Burstyn Memorial Fund, KSW Calgary Holocaust Education and Commemoration Endowment Fund, Viewpoint Foundation, and various donors to the Human Rights and Holocaust Education Fund at the Calgary Public Library Foundation. To begin our program this evening, I'd like to acknowledge Mogenstis, the lands where the Elbow and the Bow Rivers meet. In the spirit of truth and reconciliation, we recognize the ancestral territories, cultures, and oral practices of the Blackfoot people, which include the Siksika, the Bigani, the Ghana First Nations. We recognize the Iithka Stony Nakoda Nation, including Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley. And we recognize the Dene people of the Sutina First Nation. The city of Calgary is also the traditional homeland of the historic Northwest Métis and is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Calgary Public Library serves the community on this traditional land, and we honour all people who share, celebrate, and steward the Treaty 7 territory of Southern Alberta. This land acknowledgement reminds us of the histories that precede us, highlights our responsibilities going forward, and helps bring us together on a shared journey of truth and reconciliation. Now, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce you to your moderator for this evening's program, Maxine Fishbean. Originally from Edmonton, Maxine is a freelance writer and community volunteer serving in multiple professional and volunteer roles at Jewish organizations in both Calgary and in Edmonton. Recently, Maxine served as the lead writer and senior editor of Here to Tell, Faces of Holocaust Survivors. The commemorative and educational photography exhibit will open at the Glenbow Museum on May 27th. Please join me in welcoming Maxine. Thanks so much, Sarah. Mildred Harnock was the only American in the leadership of the German resistance during World War II. Her astonishing story was suppressed until our guest, Harnock's great-great-niece, Rebecca Donner, fulfilled an epic promise. Rebecca's essays, reportage, and reviews have appeared in the New York Times and Book Forum, her previous books include the novel Sunset Terrace and Burnout, a graphic novel about eco-terrorism. In her third book, All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days, Rebecca has combined her considerable talents as a writer and a scholar. Weaving together declassified intelligence reports and other archival treasures, including diary entries, family documents and photos, notes smuggled out of a Berlin prison, and the testimony of survivors. Donner has given us a genre-bending, page-turning work of narrative nonfiction that is absolutely stunning in scope. It is a biography, a love story, a political thriller, and a scholarly detective story. Mildred Harnock's courageous acts of resistance might have been lost to us, but Rebecca Donner has reversed the erasure, crafting a story so intimate and visceral that I had to remind myself to breathe. An instant New York Times bestseller, All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days has garnered numerous honors. It is a finalist for the 2022 Los Angeles Times Book Award, and recently won the Penn Jacqueline Bo Gradweld Award. Congratulations, Rebecca, on your Plutarch nomination 
and especially on the coveted 2022 National Book Critics Circle Award you received just this past Thursday. We're all looking forward to your talk, after which I'll join you again for the Q&A. Just a quick reminder to the audience to use the chat function if you have any questions. Rebecca, thank you for joining us, at least virtually, in Canada. It's a point of pride that you were born right next door in beautiful British Columbia, and it's an honor and a privilege to welcome you. Oh, thank you so much, Maxine. That was a, a lovely introduction. Um, and I'm so uh, uh, grateful to you and um, to the hosts of tonight's event. Um, it's an honor to uh, to be here and to speak to all of those of you out there who have um, registered and are watching um, right now. I think um, as Maxine pointed out, Mildred Harnock was an American graduate student who became uh, a leader of the largest underground resistance group in Berlin uh, during Hitler's regime. Uh, by 1940, it had reached that capacity. Um, Mildred is my great great aunt. Three generations separate us. Uh, when I began to think about writing this book, I knew that my familial connection would be advantageous in the sense that I had access to letters and documents and photographs uh, that people had never seen before. Uh, and, uh, and I also conducted extensive uh, research in not only the United States, but also in Germany and in England. And I worked with uh, a, a Moscow-based historian. Um, but I, I also knew that there would still be gaps. And so I began to conceive of this book uh, as a kind of a scholarly detective story. And, and from that point on, it, it, it sort of progressed into this idea of a fusion of biography, espionage thriller and scholarly detective story. And, and in so doing, I was able to allow for these gaps um, rather than erase them, but uh, to also just account for them. And um, I found that Julian Barnes's alternative definition of, of a net was useful uh, as a series of holes held together by string. And so here is in a nutshell, uh, sort of, uh, in a few broad strokes, uh, what we know about Mildred. She was born and raised in Milwaukee and lived in a shuffle of boarding houses. Um, she was the fourth and youngest child of Georgina and William Fish. Um, her father was a frequently unemployed butcher, insurance salesman, and horse trader. And uh, her mother was a self-taught stenographer. They didn't have a lot of money. They moved almost every year uh, for much of Mildred's childhood. Um, and, uh, and, and, and yet Mildred um, found inspiration in her mother, who was a suffragette. Um, her mother had a 10th grade education, but encouraged her to go to college. Uh, the University of Wisconsin in Madison um, offered uh, free tuition for state residents and, uh, and opened its doors to both women and men. Um, Mildred was inspired by this and also um, by the fact that women were granted the right to vote when uh, she turned 20. And so off Mildred went to the University of Wisconsin where she received a BA and uh, a master's degree in humanities. Uh, it was there where she met uh, a German graduate student named Arvid Harnock, and they fell swiftly in love. Arvid was a champion of left-wing labor reform as well as women's rights. And, and so uh, they very quickly got married uh, a week after she received her, her master's degree. And in 1929, at the age of 26, she enrolled in a PhD program in Germany and joined Arvid there. While she was working on her dissertation, she taught classes in American literature at the University of Berlin and was fired for taking a public stance against Hitler. She then began teaching at a night school in Berlin for adults um, that was uh, uh, basically the first of its kind. It admitted uh, poor working class students. It provided them free meals and books. And 
Mildred's students at uh, this place, she nicknamed it the bag, um, was uh, but essentially, um, it became a recruiting ground for her. Um, her students were a segment of the population that the Nazi party relentlessly targeted with propaganda. And indeed, several of Mildred's most uh, dedicated members of, of the group that she would soon form would be students that she recruited from the bag. I think at this point, we can stop and show a few slides. Um, so uh, here we go. Yes, and we can move on to the next one, slides two through seven. So this is Mildred as, as a young girl. Uh, my, my great grandmother called her a little pip um, or a great pip, uh, she used both terms. My great grandmother was Mildred's eldest sister. And this is her um, in Milwaukee. And this is Mildred um, in graduate school. She um, was, uh, was a, an excellent student in English and American literature and terrible student in French. <laughs> uh, and I went to the, to the university and I looked at all of her, um, her grades. I think I'll just take this moment to note that there is a tendency with Mildred to, um, to sort of put her up on this pedestal and to say that she was uh, perfection in all regards and to overlook that she was actually, she had flaws. Um, she, she had weak areas and strong areas, just like a, we mere mortals. And, and in fact, um, one of my objectives in writing this book was to show her as a flesh and blood human being as much as possible, somebody who was complex um, and, uh, and, and, and really to treat her as, um, as a human being, which indeed she was. Um, she was not a saint. Uh, she, she was somebody who uh, made a decision about um, at a moment in, in our history um, to resist uh, at a time when very few around her did, but more on that later. Um, moving on to the next slide. There's Mildred in, in graduate school. This is a photograph one often sees um, of Mildred. It's one of the most common uh, that's distributed. Beautiful photograph. Next one. And then this is, uh, this is one of the photographs that's chiefly in my possession, no one else has this. Um, I, and it's one of my favorites. This is Mildred with Arvid. Uh, notice that they're dressed alike. Um, <laughs> both of them have white button down shirts um, and pants and, uh, and Mildred has cut her hair. This is shortly after they married um, when they hitchhiked to um, uh, at Colorado and joined a coal miner strike protesting poor working conditions and poor pay. And uh, when they hitchhiked back, um, my great grandmother, Mildred's eldest sister saw them and declared that they looked like tramps. Um, but this, this uh, demonstrates or illustrates uh, the, the, the connection that they had, that they were interested in, in um, and, and they were politically aware, aware and uh, made their voices heard before they moved to Germany. Um, and so I think, uh, and then this is Mildred and, and Arvid in 1929, um, right, uh, just about a month after Mildred crossed the Atlantic on a steamer ship and joined him. And by this point, Mildred is working on her dissertation and, um, and soon she will be teaching at the University of Berlin and, and then after she is fired at the bag. Um, what is the next slide? Ah, uh, yes. And then this is an example of one of the letters that Mildred wrote to her mother. Uh, she sent her mother, uh, who was in uh, Wisconsin and later in Chevy Chase, Maryland, letters um, as often as she could. And they became a kind of portal uh, for me into Mildred's mind and heart. Um, she, and, uh, and so here she's describing a, a demonstration that she saw uh, with Nazis, um, and with a tank uh, uh, basically uh, shooting or aiming or uh, appearing to be ready to uh, shoot at a crowd of um, unemployed strikers. Um, so uh, 
this is a this this letter is a kind of tirade against the Nazi party and against the fascists. And she wrote this in 1932, which um, which was, of course, a year before Hitler became chancellor. OK, so we can stop sharing the screen. I just want to point out that, you know, when Mildred uh, moved to Germany in 1929. Germany was still a parliamentary democracy with a constitution that granted freedom of speech, freedom of the press, uh, freedom to assemble peacefully. Um, uh, and yet, um, Mildred could not help but notice the meteoric rise in the popularity of the Nazi party. A year before she arrived in 1928, the Nazis got uh, less than 3% of the vote in her Reichstag election. But in 1930, just two years later, it got 18%. And in 1932, the Nazi party received 37% of the vote in the Reichstag election. And for the first time, it was the largest political party in the Reichstag. And so at this time, Mildred began inviting her students to her apartment to discuss the situation, to discuss what could be done. Uh, Mildred and Arvid, over the course of the decade, continued to recruit Germans into this group, friends, friends of friends, colleagues, and Mildred privately referred to this group as the circle. Um, it intersected over these eight years with three other underground resistance groups, Tatkreis, Rittmeisterkreis, and Gegnerkreis. They were small groups uh, composed of, uh, during that time in the mid thirties, five people here, seven people there. Um, and this network formed an interlocking chain. The network was diverse. Uh, its members were Jewish, Catholic, and atheist. Uh, they were factory workers and office workers. They were students and professors. They were um, journalists. Uh, they were artists. About 40% of them were women. And what united this diverse group was their opposition to Hitler. Um, Gestapo records, uh, again, um, we can show a slide here. Uh, we can see some of the people in this group. Um, this is slides nine through 16. So these are the Gestapo mugshots of the members of the group who were um, arrested. Mildred is right there in the center. I'm, we're skipping ahead a little bit, but I want you to see uh, the people who are in this group, the handwriting here um, is, uh, uh, is, is the handwriting of Gestapo officers who uh, are noting various uh, characteristics. So we can move on to the next one. And the next one. And the next. This here, uh, this is a photo array, uh, a, a version of which appears in my book uh, to give readers just a look at some of the people in this group. Okay, we can stop here. Um, and so we can stop sharing here. I will just go back to the slide in just a second. So during my research, I discovered letters and diaries and testimonies that described Mildred's recruitment techniques. So for example, when Mildred was teaching a class um, at the University of Berlin or at the Bag, she would keep an eye out for students who appeared to oppose the Nazi party. Um, her lectures moved smoothly from depictions of poor farmers in America to the prevalence of the poor in Germany. And she would ask her students pointed questions about their viewpoints on Germany's political climate. And so by studying her students' reactions to her lectures over several months, she would get a, a kind of a sense of who might be receptive to joining the underground resistance. And as you might imagine, this technique required tremendous patience and shrewd intuition. And of course, after Hitler became chancellor in 1933, um, it became exceedingly dangerous to continue recruiting. Uh, nevertheless, she, she did so. Um, if she recruited the wrong person or attempted to recruit the wrong person, that person could easily turn her into the Gestapo. Um, and so during 
the early years of Hitler's regime, Mildred helped Jews escape. She plotted acts of sabotage. She collaborated in writing leaflets that denounced the Nazi regime and called for revolution. And the group distributed these leaflets, slipping them into mailboxes and leaving them in piles and factories and in U-Bahn stations. At this time, Mildred and Arvid and a number of members of the group uh, thought that Hitler would not last. Um, they believed he was a buffoon and believed that that Germans would rise up uh, and and um, somebody else would replace him. They wouldn't stand for him. Of course, this did not happen. And so in 1935, they devised another strategy. Leaflets were a poor weapon against the Nazi regime um, and easily exposed them to arrest. A number of members were arrested indeed and were sent to concentration camps. And so Mildred and Arvid decided that their resistance network should extend beyond Germany's borders. So Mildred got a job as a literary scout for a Berlin-based publishing company. This job was her cover, kind of sly way for her to travel to other countries and meet with contacts in the resistance. She traveled to Norway, to Sweden, um, to Denmark, Switzerland, and England. And uh, during her travels, of course, her American passport was valuable, which enabled her to travel more freely than her German co-conspirators. In 1935, Arvid got a job at the Ministry of Economics, which gave him access to classified documents about Hitler's operational and later military strategies. And Mildred and Arvid both participated in passing this intelligence to other countries, including the Soviet Union and the United States. The connection to the Soviet Union is the reason that the name of their group, which Mildred and Arvid again privately referred to as the Circle, became known as the Rote Kapelle or the Red Orchestra. Um, the, the name has its origins in the jargon of German intelligence. The Abwehr used the word orchestra um, to describe any enemy espionage network. And uh, radio transmitters were known as pianos and their operators were known as pianists. So when um, the Abwehr discovered that the group was sending messages, coded messages to Moscow, um, they called the orchestra red. And the name was subsequently picked up by intelligence agents in the US and Britain. Um, so Mildred's participation in the Soviet espionage network run by the NKVD and the GRU was well documented in British, US uh, and Soviet era intelligence files. But nowhere in these files is there mention of Mildred passing information to the United States. Um, Shireen Blair Bryzak, who published a biography about Mildred Harnock two decades ago, was the first writer to mention this connection. Um, between 1939 and 1941, an American boy named Don Heath was Mildred's courier. Uh, this, this was between the ages of 11 and 13. He showed up at Mildred's apartment ostensibly for tutor tutoring sessions twice a week, um, tutoring sessions in English and American literature. Um, and at the end of these lessons, she would slip a paper into his knapsack, which he would then give to uh, his father, Don Heath Sr., who was a diplomat at the US Embassy in Berlin. Um, Donald Heath Sr. had a confidential arrangement with the Secretary of Treasury, Henry Morgenthau Jr., uh, Assistant Secretary of State, George Messersmith, and Under Secretary of State, Sumner Wells, to obtain intelligence from key sources in Berlin. So let's take a look at Don. Um, here he is. And the next slide. There he is with his father. And there is Don Heath, his father. Um, and this is, uh, this is an example of um, some of the pages of his mother's diary, um, Louise Heath's diary. So, um, okay, we can stop sharing the screen. I, uh, I tracked John, Don down in, in California uh, when he was 89 years old and um, interviewed him. He may have been the last person alive 
who had firsthand knowledge of Mildred Harnock's wartime espionage. He had uh, an incredibly vivid memory of his uh, time as a boy in Berlin and was um, uh, really just required a few uh, prods here and there and, and just uh, a wealth of details would spring forth. A month after I interviewed him, he passed away and his family then granted me permission to review the contents of 12 steamer trunks of documents and these contain Donald Heath Sr.'s unpublished memoir and correspondence with uh, Henry Morgenthau, as well as the letters and diaries, one of the, the one you saw of, um, written by Don's mother, Louise, uh, between 1939 and 1941. So it was a real treasure trove. And uh, at the time, it just, I was still kind of conceiving of the structure of the book and, and my narrative strategy, and it just, um, it, it gave me a, a, an entirely new um, way of looking and thinking about the book um, or looking at the material and thinking of the book. So um, after a key member of the group named Harl schulze um was arrested by the Gestapo on August 31st, 1942, Mildred and Arvid fled Germany planning to escape to Sweden and a high ranking SS officer named Horst Kopko tracked them down. He drew 500 miles in pursuit of them and discovered them in Nazi occupied Lithuania. Mildred and Arvid were led in shackles to the basement prison at Gestapo headquarters in Berlin. And over the course of the next few weeks as the Gestapo made uh, numerous arrests uh, trying to uh, basically round them all up. Um, the, the Gestapo prison, uh, the basement prison filled up with members of this group. Um, and to uh, basically deal with the overflow, um, the women were sent off to women's prisons and the men were sent off to men's prisons. And then every day, uh, key members, including Mildred, were uh, um, taken back to Gestapo headquarters and interrogated and uh, in many cases, torture. So Mildred spent uh, almost five months in solitary confinement. Um, she was not permitted to read, write, um, speak to anyone. Um, and uh, in, in December, 1942, there was a um, secret trial that was conducted at the highest military court in Nazi Germany, the Reichskriegsgericht. And um, this was where Mildred and 75 of her German co-conspirators, her husband Arvid among them, were charged with high treason, uh, which carried a death sentence. And um, at her first trial, a panel of five judges um, sentenced Mildred to six years in uh, prison, um, but Hitler found out about this uh, sentence and um, overruled the decision and um, ordered her execution. And so uh, she spent the last hours of her life in a cell at Plötzensee prison uh, in Berlin, translating a book of Goethe poems. Um, the title of my book, All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days, is a line from one of these poems. And the prison chaplain, um, whose name was Harald Polschau, was a secret member of the resistance. Uh, after meeting with her, uh, he smuggled out Mildred's translations under the folds of his robe. And it's the reason that we have that book today. Um, so if we can show the next slide. That's it right there. Um, so you see Mildred's handwritten translations in the margins. Uh, and so this is, I think this brings me to the end of this uh, summary of, of Mildred's life uh, in, in a series of snapshots um, and her participation in the resistance. There's, uh, I think we can stop sharing this, the slide. Um, I, I think, uh, I, I know, um, 
there are lots of questions that you may have and, and I encourage you to, um, to enter them into the chat and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, and uh, yeah, so Maxine, hello. I think you're on mute. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Rebecca. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful summary. I'm wondering if you can take us back just a couple of years um, and tell us what your reaction was when your grandmother presented you with Mildred's letters and asked you to write about her. Yes. Well, um, that's a great question. I, I, I think, um, you know, I was aware of Mildred as a kind of spectral presence in my childhood. Um, when I was about nine, I visited Chevy Chase, Maryland, where my great grandmother lived, um, and where Mildred lived during her senior year of high school. Uh, after her father passed away, her mother moved her to her eldest sister's house. Um, and uh, and uh, she was married by that point. Um, and, and so there I was in my great grandmother's kitchen and I saw these um, marks in the wall and, and they marked uh, where the children, of various generations had gotten their height measured. And my great grandmother asked me to stand up against the wall and she measured, put a ruler in my head and measured my height, uh, made a mark on the wall and I stood back and, and I looked at my mark and then I looked at the other marks in the wall and I saw one that had an initial next to it M and I said, who's that? And she said, Mildred, but she said it like that, like the, with, with kind of a brittleness in her voice. And, and, and I sensed at the age of nine that there was a story there. And I didn't understand exactly why her emotion was, was uh, so, sort of why there was anger um, and, and sadness and, um, and why she refused to talk about it. But then when I was 16, um, my grandmother um, told me more. And so this, is a, this was at the time when my grandmother, Jane, and she appears in my book. Um, she, she is actually, uh, she is part of the story because she uh, was lived for a time with Mildred in her apartment in Berlin while Mildred and Arvid were in the resistance and while they kept that a secret from her. Um, uh, and then she, Jane also wrote, letters to her parents describing that. So anyway, they're very useful for me um, in telling the story. But uh, here, here I was um, uh, at 16 and Jane gave me these letters and she said, she knew at that point I wanted to be a writer. I basically declared I wanted to be a writer at about nine. Uh, and, uh, and, and so she, she, said, so she, she took me seriously. I mean, she took my ambition seriously. And she said, uh, she gave me the letters and she told me more of the story. And then she said, I want you to write about this one day. And so I promised I would. Great, and, and um, so you knew you'd write it someday. And um, I'll ask this question in two words, why now? <laughs> well, um, yes. So of course I had it in the back of my mind for years and years. And, uh, and I wrote two works of fiction and I was working on another one. Uh, or after the second one, I actually did go to Berlin and visit the Gedenkstätte Deutsche Widerstand, which is the German Resistance Memorial Center and introduced myself and said, uh, you know, I would like to have access to your materials. I know my grandmother has given you some and I know that you have a whole lot more. And so I sort of began some preliminary research then, but I was also aware that I, I wanted, I, I did not want to write this as historical fiction. And at this point I was just writing fiction, writing articles, working as a journalist here and there, but, um, and reviewing books, but, but I hadn't undertaken a book length work of, of nonfiction. And I felt very strongly that this had to be a work of nonfiction and that I needed to do a lot of research uh, and, and, and visit archives in many countries in order to really get at the bottom of uh, sort of the espionage story, for example, because the, the, those who have written over the decades about the espionage aspect 
of the Red Orchestra, uh, focused on these sensationalistic aspects that um, that that were uh, well greatly exaggerated, but also uh, there, there were lots of inaccuracies and and outright falsehoods, um, and some of them had to do with Mildred. And so I wanted to kind of correct the record, set the set the record straight, uh, and and also understand more of the nuances. Um, a lot and, and, and also uh, you know, uncover documents that had not yet been uncovered. Uh, a lot of the, the espionage documents, the intelligence documents were redacted. So when I, I had to send Freedom of Information Act requests um, uh, uh, to the FBI and CIA and, and, and some of them came back uh, uh, with, with documents that were still redacted with big black splotches. Then I had to submit appeals and so, um, and, and so it was a lengthy process, um, but I think, um, you know, I, I was I was kind of, as I would, then I was writing a third novel and I was sort of, it, again, the, 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 the Mildred book was, I was sort of gathering steam and it was in the back of my head. And I kept on, sort of, I was reading a lot in um, this period and reading histories, but also uh, um, memoirs and, and novels and, and, and really, um, expanding my sense of what was possible. Um, and, uh, and then in the run up to the uh, presidential election in 2016, I just, I was seized with this sense of urgency. And I thought, I, I, I have to write this book right now. I have to stop what I'm doing. So I stopped the novel that I'd been working on for six years, put it on the back burner and began writing this book in earnest. And are we ever glad you did. Um, of course, your book is the result of all that painstaking research that you've been describing. Um, I'm just wondering what your most thrilling and unusual finds were. Oh, wow. Um, there were many. And of course, one of them was that book, um, The Goethe Book of Poems. Um, that that Mildred um, was writing in shortly before her her death, um, I, but also I, I, there were a few others. And actually, if we could just pull up the the slides again, I can show you some of them. My cat is meowing. Uh, while you're doing that, while you're pulling up the slides, I'm going to let my cat out so he doesn't meow and distract us. Actually, go. Um, if we can share the slides again. There, Hamza. Hamza, are you there? Yep, yeah, just a second. Okay. Uh, and so um, I think the first one, uh, oh, I know, uh, is, um, so uh, there's a section of the book that concerns Mildred's imprisonment. And because I mentioned she was in solitary confinement, she was not allowed to write anything or read anything. And so this presented a challenge. And how do I describe her in the cell if I don't have anything? Um, so we're just gonna go to the very end, the last two slides. And what I discovered in a, in a, uh, in a Berlin archive was, um, were these notes that were passed in prison, these secret notes, um, and they were called Kassiber in, in, in German and, and they were, uh, prohibited in, in these um, in, in prison, you know, guards got paid extra money for for um, for uh, snatching them from people's hands and pockets. Um, uh, but but still, it was the only way that 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 uh, women in Mildred's group could communicate with one another. So here's an example of one, um, and you can see uh, this is both sides of, of a piece of paper. Um, and repurposed here, and um, and this was just it was another treasure. I I, I found uh, you know some of the some of the notes. This look this is basically a letter, um, and and women would you know they'd fold them up and they would either stuff them in the crevices of um, and the cracks and crevices in their in their prison walls. Um, sometimes they would pass them uh, on the walk in the prison yard. They were allowed a. a a brief walk every day. Um, and sometimes they would sew them in the garments of their prison uniforms. Um, so th these prisons um, during the Second World War, uh, part, some of the cost 
savings or containment uh, strategies that they employed was that they required the families of the prisoners to do the laundry of their family member who was incarcerated, and it became an excellent way of passing notes back and forth. So, uh, so they would sew the notes in the garments of, of their dirty laundry, send it back to their families, and their families would keep the notes and send send messages back. Um, uh, Mildred's extended family um, uh, through Arvid, Arvid's cousins, um, a number of them were involved um, in, in the resistance and they included um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Klaus Bonhoeffer, Ernst von Harnack, Hans von Dokinanyi, and Justus Delbruck. They were all involved in the Valkyrie plot to assassinate Hitler in 1944. And there, um, and, and, uh, but this was something that, and I write about this in my book too, um, over many years, they they uh, were involved in the resistance, and that was sort of the culmination of their involvement. They were um, all executed. Uh, Eustace Delbruck um, shot himself, um, but um, their families, um, in the years leading up to the Second World War, devised already they, they practiced ways of communicating, um, and and one thing they did, um, and I discovered this in the memoir of of one of the wives of of um, these men, um, they would practice writing minuscule notes and then they would hide them in jars of beans that they would take um, in these kind of prison care packages. Sometimes prisoners were allowed to receive these care packages. They were allowed to receive books or uh, food from, uh, and, uh, from family members. It depended on who you were. So uh, Mildred again was prohibited uh, and um, from receiving anything. Um, but um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a very visible person in Germany, um, and he was a um, Lutheran pastor, and, and um, if anybody, he's fairly well known in, in resistance um, studies, uh, he was permitted to receive all of these things. Um, and so he, and he also, uh, in the books that he would um, borrow from him, or his family would give him, he would underline a word, a letter of a word, um, and then uh, several pages later, uh, later, another very faint with a pencil line, and then several pages later, another letter. And over the course of the whole book, there would be a message. Um, and again, this was something that the family rehearsed uh, in in the years um, leading up to the Second World War. So they were sort of preparing for this kind of thing. Um, in any case, all of these, uh, the, the this this archival discovery was. Um, enabled me to learn more about Mildred's uh, time in prison. One of the notes described her, uh, a woman was speculating whether Mildred was losing her mind, um, that she seemed rather um, touched um, was the word she used. Um, I mean, the translated that terms like touched um, and, and, and she, uh, uh, and, and then an another woman described how uh, a member of the group Libertas Schulzeboysen um, basically uh, told her Gestapo interrogators a, a lot of names of people in the group, uh, so intending to um, maybe save her own life. Uh, it didn't she didn't succeed. She also was executed. But um, th these disclosures did result in the arrest and later execution of a number of members of this group. So, uh, but in, in the sort of rumor mill in, in, the, in the prison, this one prisoner wrote about her and, and uh, nicknamed her Lips. Um, her name was Libs, but there was this sort of pun that she was blabbing. Um, another archival discovery that was amazing was the, it was the next slide um, I can show you. Greta Kukov, who was a member of the group, um, Hamza, if you could just advance the slide. There we go. So this, uh, Greta Kukov survived, um, and, um, but she was, she did go through the whole uh, process of being arrested and interrogated and imprisoned. And, uh, and she went to the court trial at the Reichskriegsgericht. And this right here is um, uh, a, a drawing that she made of, of the courtroom. And, and she's taking notes here. Uh, this this was another a tremendous archival discovery. So it enabled me, these are the kinds of documents that enabled me to paint a really vivid picture, uh, relying on primary source documents, um, a picture of what of, of what occurred. Thanks, Rebecca. Wow. Um, there's um, 
another um, item, another archival item that was smuggled uh, out of the prison. And I'm wondering whether you can comment on it. I think I know what you're going to say. <laughs> Is this the letter? Yeah. Yeah. I'm. Gonna, I didn't put it on my slide, but I'm gonna. He, I'm gonna put it right here. I, I mean, it is. It is. Um, this is it in my book. Um, uh, it's. I, mean, I don't know if you can see very well. It's very faint. The light. The if you see the book it, it, and sort of put it up to your face, you'll you'll see more of it. But you can see the creases in in um, the pages. This is a letter that Arvid wrote right before his execution. And, um, and he uh, arranged for uh, it to be smuggled into Mildred's cell. Um, Mildred read it countless times. We know this because she was given a cellmate. Um, she was on they, basically, uh, after all the solitary confinement, um, they were worried that she would commit suicide. And, and so for, for prisoners who, who uh, sparked those concerns, um, the, the prison officials would put another prisoner in the cell. Um, this, this prisoner was, um, was uh, uh, Gertrude Klaputh. She was a member of another resistance group. And I did a tremendous amount of research on her. This is her face, right? I just, anyway, um, she's just, so what steely conviction she has. Gertrude um, uh, dis basically um, spent a month in that prison cell with Mildred. And then Mildred gave her the letter and said, if you survive, please give this back to the Harnock family. Um, give it back to Arvid's mother. And Gertrude promised that she would. Um, she was transferred to Ravensbrück concentration camp. Uh, she survived and she kept her promise. And she, uh, it took her a while. Um, she, she uh, in, in, a, in, a, in an interview uh, when she was in her seventies, she noted that, that for years she just couldn't, she tried, she couldn't think about what had happened uh, and tried to just move forward. But in 1952, she saw a mention in a newspaper about Clara Harnock, who was, um, Clara Harnock, uh, who was um, Harvard's mother. And she wrote to her and said, um, I, I have something that you need to have. And so she wrote two letters uh, and described in detail that month that she spent with Mildred, um, where they had this routine. They, and every day they had a routine. Uh, Mildred sort of, um, uh, it was, she was so delighted to have company. And, um, and they would read read to each other, they would sing songs to each other um, and, uh, and, and describe their dreams and describe uh, their families. And Mildred spoke a great deal about Arvid and, um, and, and Gertrude saw her reading the letter over and over again. And so uh, the, the letter is, is, a, is just a testament to um, the love. I, this, is, this, this book is, is so many things and one of the things it is is a love story um and so when i um i i mean it's it's a rather long uh letter but i'll just read one one little you know a couple sentences to give that would you be wonderful paper. yeah um my dear beloved heart yeah see i i every time i read this i, I tear up i have read this countless times Remember, he wrote this just hours before he was executed. He was executed by hanging. I should also mention that the men in the group were hanged or shot and the women were decapitated by guillotine. Um, so, uh, and, and Arvid, Arvid was given, um, uh, there, there was the, the at Plutensee prison in the same room where Mildred was executed. Uh, that's where the, um, basically the hooks were. Um, and, I mean, he knew that he was facing a violent death. He predicted that that would probably happen. But this is this tells you something about his state of mind. Um, well, he tried to remain composed and also reflect on um, his love for Mildred. My dear beloved heart, if in the last months I found the strength to be inwardly calm and composed, 
It is because I felt a strong attachment to all that is good and beautiful in the world. A feeling that sings out of the poet Whitman. Those who are close to me embody this feeling, especially you. Despite the pain, I look back gladly on my life. The bright outshone the dark and our marriage is to the greatest degree the reason for this. Last night, I let many of the wonderful moments of our marriage go through my head. And the more I thought about them, the more memories came. It was at, as if I looked at a starry sky in which the numbers of stars increase, the more meticulously one looks. He goes on for a few paragraphs and says, at the end, you are in my heart. You shall be in there forever. My greatest wish is that you are happy when you think of me. I am when I think of you. The many, many kisses, hugging you tight, your A. Wow. And they never, uh, they didn't have an opportunity uh, really to say goodbye, did they? That, that was good. They did not. The, the last time they saw each other was in the first court trial. Uh, they were forbidden to speak. Um, but the, the court appointed lawyer, um, I mean, the whole proceeding was just a sham, um, but the, the, there was a court appointed lawyer uh, described to the Harnock family afterwards that um, Arvid just and Mildred were just beaming at each other and, and sort of looking at each other from across the room. Wow. Um, I see a question somebody wrote, uh, at, was this letter written in English? No, actually it was written in German. Um, it's, and you can't see this, um, but there, you can't see it. There's a little, there's a little sun, there's a little sunshine there um, that he wrote and he wrote Sonne. Um, and, and, uh, and that same, uh, this, is, this is how a symbol goes, you know, traces across or, or uh, extends across the generations. That sunshine is the sunshine that Mildred would put at the end of her letters to her mother. That sunshine and her mother was my grandmother's, uh, uh, pardon me, to her mother and to her sister. So, and her sister was my grandmother's mother. So that my grandmother, sorry, this is getting very confusing, but the, in the genealogical, basically this is what you need to know. Through the generations, that little sunshine um, that, that really began with Mildred's mother, then she, Mildred's mother passed it down to Mildred, Mildred passed it down to, um, um, uh, or, and, and then uh, also it was passed down to my grandmother. And then my grandmother, when she wrote letters to me, put the little sunshine. So Mildred wrote the sunshine to Arvid and then the letters that he wrote to his family, he would put the little sunshine on it. So <laughs> um, I, um, uh, it, it's, it's just, I, when I saw the letter and I saw that sunshine, I just, I, I just felt my, my heart sang. I thought, um, anyway, that survived that, that sunshine. What, uh, what a treasure that that yeah. letter, uh, survived. Uh, I, I, I know. Can share I hear that story. I, um, it, it is such a treasure and such a gift and, uh, and, Anyway, I, I devote a whole chapter to Gertrude at Robin's book concentration camp because I wanted to honor her story. And, you know, that was one of my aims in writing this book was to tell the stories of people whose stories had not been heard yet. Um, when you typically, uh, when we hear about the Walter de Capella, the Red Orchestra, we hear about the, the men uh, and, and, and specifically Arvid Harnock and Harald schulz Boysen. Um, the network for years was was referred to in Germany as the Harnack Schulze Boysen network, um, uh, but but the Harnack was not referring to Mildred at all, uh, and she was depicted as somebody who would follow follow alongside her husband, um, do what he was told. A lot of German historians characterized her that way, um, and uh, but a, a closer look at at the archival evidence. Um, and post-war testimonies demonstrated, um, and uh, uh, without a shadow of the doubt, that that Mildred was um, running meetings um, after 1935, when Arvid started working at the Ministry of Economics. He was not allowed to be seen with any left-wing people. He had to pretend that he was a Nazi in order to gain access to these top-secret documents, and so. Uh, Mildred began running the meetings, um, and uh, and she was the main recruiter, um, and uh, and of course she was deeply involved in passing documents, not only to the um, or assisting with couriering uh, intelligence to the 
Soviet Union, but also to the United States through Don Heath? Um, a bunch of questions from the uh, audience. Um, one is very near and dear to my heart. Um, and it is, has Mildred been honored by the American government? And I'll, I'll just add to that. Uh, I know that uh, we were talking about Varian Fry when we chatted last week. Um, yeah. He was the first American to be honored, a very few actually, to be honored as righteous among the nations at Yad Vashem, yep. uh, Israel's Holocaust Museum. Uh, and I'm just wondering um, really why Mildred hasn't been uh, so honored. And then also that question, has the American government recognized Mildred in any way? Um, well, uh, so a compound question, I'll, I'll answer the second one first, um, uh, which is, to, and, and I think that, um, uh, you know, it's an, this is an important part of the story. Uh, and, and I write about, I devote a chapter to this in my book as well. But after the war, um, the, the US intelligence, uh, counterintelligence corps, the, um, the CIC opened up an investigation. Uh, and um, and uh, uh, there, was, there were an initial uh, efforts to track down Manfred Roder, who was the chief prosecutor uh, who was responsible for sending uh, uh, Mildred to her death, and he actually watched the her decapitation along with uh, at least five other um, Nazi officials. Um, so there, so there, so there were efforts to try, to, and there are memos that I found, uh, declassified memos uh, written between CIC officials saying uh, Mildred Harnock was clearly, a, a, you know, a, a, a you know a, a, a courageous woman and. Um, and should be honored, and uh, and and Roda should be um, brought to Nuremberg and tried as a war criminal. And and uh, but but then um, uh, there was another official, a more senior CIC official, who wrote to his colleagues and said, "Bury the case." Um, uh, and another memo uh, that said Mildred's execution was justified. This is an American official talking about an American citizen who was decapitated on Hitler's order, calling that justified. Um, why was this so? Uh, well, the, the Cold War politics tell us everything we need to know. Mildred was viewed through a Cold War lens after the war. Um, the, some of the Nazis who were involved, directly involved in the um, arrest torture um, and execution of Mildred and uh, her co-conspirators um, were not tried as war criminals, but were in fact recruited as agents for US and British intelligence. Um, Horst Kopko, who I mentioned, uh, who drove 500 miles in pursuit of Mildred and Arvid and tracked them down in Nazi-occupied Lithuania. Um, he presided over their torture as well. He assigned uh, the, uh, their interrogator, who was known for being a sadistic um, um, Nazi who, who enjoyed various torture techniques, um, which I note in my book. But uh, um, anyway, um, Horst Kupko was recruited by MI6, um, uh, who, uh, it, after he convinced them that he knew about this Soviet espionage network that was just about to threaten uh, you know, uh, Western democracies, and if they just, um, you know, recruited him instead of uh, sending him to Nuremberg, then he uh, could tell them so much about this vast communist network. And uh, so MI6 believed uh, Horst Kopko, and they um, faked his death, gave him a new identity as a, a man, a textile manager named Peter Cordes, and uh, he was never sent to Nuremberg. Um, and and Manfred Roda, same thing. He was recruited, you know, right before he was indicted. Um, he was whisked away by um, agents. Uh, they they didn't fake his death, but they gave him a, new, a code name, Othello, and uh, and and then uh, and, you know, and and he kept up the ruse um, for at least um, nine months, uh, somewhere in that range. Um, nine, 10 months uh, that, that he also had this knowledge of this vast 
communist conspiracy that was threatening the Western world. And, um, and, and then uh, at some point, um, the US intelligence agents saw that they had been duped, but by that point, uh, they just let him go. So, so this this is this is part of the reason um, that Mildred's case was buried uh, for oh you know over fifty years. It wasn't until the nineteen ninety eight Nazi War Crimes Disclosure Act uh, uh, that mandated the declassification of so many of these intelligence documents uh, pertaining to this period that, uh, that suddenly the story started coming out. And also uh, when the Berlin Wall came down a few years. You know, earlier, um, th there were documents that were in um, what used to be East Germany uh, in an archive there that came to light. And so from these two sources now, uh, there was a, a, you know, a clearer picture of this group and of the American woman who was at the center of it. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Um, on the question of Yad Vashem, I oh, just yeah. like to, I just like to suggest that maybe you yeah. submit your book as as the application. <laughs> Thank you for it for that for that suggestion. I certainly will. I've had this question come up a number of times in my in the events that I've done, um, and uh, and and there's and and so yes, um, uh, I, I think you know it's certainly something that I will pursue. That would uh, be great. Um, so um, we're almost out of time, but I just have to ask you one last question. I understand that you're hard at work on your next book. I'm just wondering whether you can give us a teaser and maybe also tell us what you're reading. Oh, sure. Well, um, I was initially going to bring out that novel that I had been working on for six years and that I put on ice uh, um, when I decided to pursue writing this book in earnest. But I received so many emails and letters and messages uh, from readers who are so interested in learning more um, and, uh, and, and um, more history. Um, the way that I write history uh, and, and sort of the way that I um, approached this book. You know, I wrote, I wrote it in the present tense. Um, I wrote it uh, with a sort of narrative flair, uh, again, deeply researched with, with extensive endnotes, but you feel as if you're reading a novel, even though there's nothing fictional about it. Uh, and I started thinking, you know, I, I actually would like to stay in this genre. Um, um, and I'm fascinated uh, by um, the idea of resistance, who resists? Why does somebody make that choice? Um, and I think that that uh, you know, um, it, 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 during this time, uh, in particular in our history, I think it's important for us to learn more about people who did resist, who risked their lives um, to do so. And so, I, it, it, Paul Karnak, who was Mildred's brother-in-law, um, it was Arvid's younger brother, Paul Karnak, um, was a member of the Weisse Rosa, the White Rose. And, uh, and this was a group that had at its center um, Hans Scholl and Sophie Scholl. They were college students um, at, at the University of Munich. And uh, they were active during a nine month period um, between 1942 and 1943. Sophie Scholl was 21 when she was executed by guillotine, just six days after Mildred was executed. And uh, because again, I have a familial connection uh, to this group through Falk Karnak, who managed to survive um, just barely, um, I decided uh, I would like to write about the White Rose. And so that's, that's what I'm going to do. Um, and uh, it will be published by Random House in a few years. I look forward to speaking with you then. Yes. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to doing, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be heading off to the, to the archives shortly. Um, so yeah, and what am I reading very quickly? Uh, so I'm going to write about um, more extensively about Stalingrad in that book um, uh, that I'm writing about the White Rose. Um, and uh, because uh, several members of the group um, were there and, and viewed atrocities, including the mass mass the, the, the massacre of Jews. Um, and so this is a book that I'm rereading. Um, Anthony Beaver's Stalin. I just I love Anthony Beaver. Uh, he's a he presents a wealth of information. He writes in in a very narratively exciting way. And this is just a way that I I just sort of get my mind into the material before I go to the archives and and research it. Just 
it, it's, um, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me. I'm also reading, rereading, I do a lot of rereading, The Hair with Amber Eyes. If anybody has, this, this came out years ago. Oh, I, I just adore this book and you can see that I have it all marked up. And, but it's, um, it's and, and I recently went to, there's, a, um, there's an exhibition at a, a Jewish museum here in New York and um, where I got to see the, the Natsuki, these, these little porcelain, um, um, figurines. Uh, figurines that that his family owned, um, uh, and um, uh, and so that that was amazing to see as well. Uh, that and so I'm rereading the. I started rereading the book before I went to the exhibition, and I'm still <laughs> rereading it. I, I, and I think that it it uh, you know he pursues his the story of his family and um, that, which as a kind of scholarly detective story. Um, over five generations. And uh, so, so that's a, a deeply interesting book to me. And this is the last one. Um, this is the oral history of children of World War II. Um, she is a, a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, and um, I'm also just fascinated with uh, different perspectives. I like to look at a, so, sort of a kaleidoscopic view of a particular mm -hmm. period, which is what I did in in my book and which I'll do in the next one. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in oral histories uh, and, and in hearing the stories of people who, again, whose stories have, have not yet been heard. Well, thank you so, so much, Rebecca. You've just lengthened my, uh, my <laughs> wish list. I'll look forward to speaking with you in a couple of years about your next book. Yes, I need And indeed. I am going to pass you over now to Gillian Horwitz in Edmonton. Great. Well, good evening, everyone. I am Gillian Horwitz, and I am involved with Holocaust education with the Jewish Federation of Edmonton. Rebecca, how can I thank you for your fabulous, on behalf of everyone, of course, insightful presentation tonight. You really have brought your great, great aunt Mildred Harnock to light for us, and I am excited to read the book, although I know it's amazing. And for those who want to buy the book and have the book, you can buy it at Owl's Books Nests, or that's in Calgary, or Audrey's Books in Edmonton. And of course, it's available in both libraries in Edmonton and Calgary. It's an amazing book, and I can see why you are the recipient of so many amazing and prestigious awards. And if this wasn't a virtual presentation tonight, we'd all be giving you a standing ovation. <laughs> thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank and of you. course, a special thank you as well to Maxine Fishbein for moderating tonight's Q&A. Now, I would like to invite you all to fill out the survey that will appear on your screens when you leave this evening's program. We rely on your comments and suggestions in guiding future programs, and we welcome your opinions. Please join us next month for the final presentation in our Holocaust series this spring entitled Operation Finale, The Capture and Trial of Adolf Eichmann. On Sunday, April the 24th at 11 a.m., we will be joined by former Mossad officer, that's the Israeli Secret Intelligence Service, and Operation Eichmann expert, Avna Avraham, as he takes us through the real insider story of the historic 1960 capture of Nazi war criminal, Adolf Eichmann. So good night, everyone, and thank you again for zooming in on tonight's program. Thank you.